All right, everyone. Hello. Welcome back. Uh, we are... Ooh, that last card is out of frame. Let me just scooch everything slightly. Give everything a little jostle to make sure we have all of the cards in frame. Good enough. All right. Hello, everybody. We are, despite my internet's aggressive protestations... Goodness gracious, I don't know what's making the internet explode tonight. My sincerest apologies. Do I even want to... Sorry, I hate to be this way, but do I even want to try to stream when the internet's doing this to me? I have 160... I don't have internet. I don't have internet. This is, this is now recording only. I give up. We can see almost everything. Not anymore, they can't. Let's try and restart the stream. I mean, as soon as I stopped streaming, the internet returned to functioning. So, maybe just start the stream again? Okay. Uh, as soon as I decide to give up for the night, internet stop working? Internet start working? Hello? Sometimes you can see, sometimes it's laggy. Okay, uh, yeah, I just watched, I'm, my internet's flying all over the place. I don't know what the deal is tonight. Maybe if I turn this off, does that help? No, it actually makes it worse. Okay, um, I'm gonna keep trying then. I'm gonna keep trying. And we are going to hope and pray that the internet does not just continuously explode. Can I not have any fun? No fun allowed? No fun allowed, said my internet service provider. Gonna keep trying. Oh, my internet sorts itself out. I'm just gonna keep trying. Okay, we're gonna play. I'm glad you can see almost everything. That'll probably work just fine. Uh, we are gonna play a game. We're going to play a game called Punch Card Memories. Now, I've done all the setup. Uh, we have a little pawn here to keep track of where we are on the board. We have our board of cards uh, that is a specific number of shuffled cards. Um, and we've got the computer that's recording for us. Uh, so that's that, and I think we can begin. Uh, oh, first of all, before we get too far in, I cannot type in chat. Neat. Love that. Okay, you're gonna see the camera bounce around a little. We start with 25 brain juice. And I'm going to need you all in chat to help me keep track of that. If I don't mention how much brain juice we have, uh, you all need to mention it. But I will do my best to mention it because the internet's going to be flippantly flirting all over the place. Because I live in a place with functioning internet, clearly. It'd be too easy for me to have uh, internet that functions all of the time. So, we are a mind that has been digitized in some way. A mind that has been preserved away from our body in some way. 
what way, we get to decide. Uh, we get to decide in the starting part of the game. So before we take any turns and move our little guy here, uh, we decide how are we preserved. Are we a brain in a jar in a robot body? Are we a ghost being reflected through an endless series of crystals? Are we a sentient magic item that gets passed from person to person? We get to decide. I am feeling... Uh, I think it's particularly on brand for the name of the game to be... Uh, thank you, Stream Elements, for letting everyone know I am streaming. Um, we're probably going to get a lot of that when the stream uh, clicks on and off. I hope these count uh, all as one continuous stream. Uh, where was I? I got interrupted. See, this is why I need to digitize my brain, because I will completely lose my thoughts, and I need those. Um, we are a digitized brain. I, th I like the idea of we are a series of punch cards that is being possessed by a ghost. <laughs> like, we were a programmer in the era of old IBM. You know, when punch cards actually mattered, when an 80 character limit was actually worth doing something with. And we died in the process of producing this program, and we were trying to do something really fancy. We can't exactly remember what we were trying to do that was really fancy, but <clears throat> we do remember that we were trying to make something real cool, real fancy, and in the process, uh, we overworked ourselves and died. But because we had unfinished business, we got to choose one thing to possess. And we decided, well, why not? Why the heck not become part of the computer? Uh, we possessed our, uh, our last copy of punch cards. And we are now a computerized brain through the power of a ghost being part of the punch cards. I like that a lot. Does our character have a name yet? Uh, as much as I want to go with Gladys, I don't think that... That's a little too on the nose. Uh, let's name our person... Uh, you know what? That feels fun. Uh, let's go Amber. We are Amber. Is that an acronym? Maybe eventually, not right now, but it is an acronym eventually. We are Amber. We are a series of punch cards that have been possessed by a ghost, and we are trying to find chunks of our human memory um, left behind. Uh, and the way our ghostly brain is managing to process that is something called a memory a memory palace excuse me now uh we get to decide what this memory palace looks like uh i i am resisting the urge to make it a library sorry let me gesture on screen so you all have something to look at or maybe while i'm ch talking i can just tilt the camera upward how's that that's good while i'm talking and doing setup you all can see what i look like um, it is my face on Monday. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a good, uh, name for the series of things I'm doing with tabletop things on Monday. Originally, this was on Tuesday, and I could be like, yeah, it's tabletop Tuesday, but it's not that way anymore. Um, where was I? Oh, memory palace. So we get to decide what our memory palace looks like. I am resisting the urge to make it an old Victorian library because that's played out. People have done that a thousand times. My my brain is a library that I can walk through, or my brain is an over-elaborate Victorian mansion. That's been done too many times. I'm not doing that. Uh, or rather, I'm resisting the urge to do that, despite how good of an idea it is. I think I like the idea of our memory palace being a... Um, being kind of appropriate for what we are as a computerized entity, I think our memory palace is a seemingly endless series of 
old tape drives. You know, the big IBM tape drives where the reels are this big and they... You know. Uh, and that's all of our memories. And we need to wander through... Uh, we need to mentally wander through this tape bay, this database, if you will, uh, of our memories. You know what I just realized? Sorry, I'm cutting myself off off here. Uh, I am realizing that because my internet is not working, I do not have captions. I don't like that. <laughs> Why is my internet doing this to me? Hang on, I have a better idea. Let me try using my cell phone uh, to see if I can have better internet that way. This wasn't a problem the other day. This wasn't the problem last time I streamed on Friday. What the heck? I live in a place with functioning internet. Mm -hmm. Let me see if turning on the mobile hotspot on my phone will make things a little more consistent here. So, network and internet settings. <sighs> I love being out in the middle of nowhere. Show available networks. Choose my cellular cellular device. Choose my, choose my phone. What do you mean no internet access? What do you mean, no internet access? It's right there. The internet's right there. Use it. It's sitting right off of screen, directly off to the right. I believe in you. Come on. You can do it. You can do it. Connect, please. No internet secured. It says there's no internet when I do that. Never mind, my clever plan of using my cell phone did not work. Okay. Well, I want to tell the story tonight, so we're telling the story tonight, gosh darn it. If my, regardless of how my internet is holding out, I am... I am telling this story, gosh darn it, and you're letting me tell this story. Where were we? Our name is Amber. We are a ghost possessing a bunch of p punch cards, and we're trying to find our human memories by walking through a giant database. Um, that's where we were. What's next? Uh, yeah. Take time to visualize the area, yeah. Okay, move on to the aces. They are on the my left, your right side of the board. You cannot see one of them because then the bo be because I need the whole board to be on screen and they are the ones that matter. Move on to the aces, your four starting core memories. Each suit represents a different kind of memory, but each card a specific moment in your past. You have only four core memory slots, boom, 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 but you can retain more memories that are not quite as central to your being. Spades, we'll put spades up top. Spades relate to hobbies, a vocation, or your career, any meaningful work. You know, we've got a lot of thoughts about our meaningful work, considering it was the last thing we ever did in the world. Hearts are relationships, significant people who have touched your life. Rivals, lovers, you know, that kind of thing. Diamonds are items, physical things that hold symbolic power. Like, say, the series of punch cards we live in. Or, you know, a, a, a roll of masking tape that we use to undo bad punches. Or, you know, things that are important to us. Uh, clubs are flashes of insight into your last moments of being merely human. All we've decided is that we've uh, overworked ourselves, so there's plenty of uh, insight to be had there. You'll refine what these suits mean to you as you play. During your play, as you gather memories for each card, go to the memory prompt, prompts by suit, and consider the questions. So, uh, these first, play, picture your place in the junk memory palace, flip the card under your pawn, 
and reference the card prompt. If you like, spend a moment to think, but note uh, note down your answers, and then uh, and then we move our pawn with one brain juice. And we can slurp up new memories with more brain juice. A number card is one brain juice. A face card is two brain juice. And each time we move is one brain juice. So, that being said, uh, we can regain brain juice by sacrificing a memory. Uh, we regain ten brain juice by sacrificing a memory. And that's all we need to know. Uh, let's begin. We flip our first card under the, under the top corner here, the nine of diamonds, something about a significant item to us. So we scroll down to the prompts, diamonds, nine of diamonds. Once you were part of a community, who were you closest to? Oh, wait, D but, uh, but diamonds... Okay, uh, sure. Once you were part of a community, who were you closest to? Did you stay together or drift apart? So diamonds are about items. So what do we find in our memory palace uh, that reminds us of a thing that we d used to do? I think that as we begin walking in our memory palace, you know, we wake up in this giant memory bay bank place and as we walk we see you know as we walk past each spool of magnetic tape we find that each of them has a little monitor attached to the front of it and uh and if we stop and type on the keyboard in front of the monitor that we want to you know we we type like playback or something let's say the command is playback we type playback and we look and we see on the monitor our memories. So the first thing we see uh, on this monitor is uh, a deck of cards, fitting, <laughs> fittingly for how we're playing this game. Uh, we, to blow off some steam uh, after work, we had a group of people we'd go play canasta with. That's right. I'm saying canasta instead of bridge. Fight me. Um, <laughs> We, did, we had a group we'd go play Canasta with. Was it always for stakes? No, not really. But when it was for stakes, it was always fun. And it was a great time even if we weren't losing money in the process. Uh, and, you know, Canasta can be played partnered. And we didn't always play partnered Canasta. But when we did, uh, we always had the same partner. And, you know, you, you develop a very interesting sort of rapport as you're trying to develop a... a What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a, a sort of table talk with somebody to kind of get across, like, I have this card, so you should play that card. And uh, we look on this deck of cards and find that the time we spent playing this game was not ever about the money. It was always about the friendships we made along the way. And... Honestly, the last thing we remember was packing up, packing up the last, uh, or honestly, one of the, one of the few things we can remember right now is packing up after work, excited to go play Canasta with these people. So, you know, it's very important to us. So of course it's a core memory. Core memory goes on top of the ace, thank you. And we spend one brain juice for that. So we're now at, is it going to let me type? 24 brain juice. Neat. And then we're going to spend another brain juice to move. Uh, I'm going to move... I'm going to move diagonally first, because you can do that. The, the piece move is like a king in chess. So we're going to spend another brain juice. 23 brain juice so we find this first memory of playing canasta with people and we are very very uh very fulfilled we're like dang 
I didn't remember being a human being this great. I'm really enjoying myself. Let's see what the next terminal over has. And we think about it for a second. We, we are about to, you know, go walk to the next terminal over. And then think about it for a second and go, that's too easy. So we walk, we walk out of the aisle and down and around to the di the uh, terminal that is cat corner from the one we started at. And we type playback. And what do we find on that monitor? We find the 10 of hearts. Uh, what does that do for us? Memory prompts. 10 of hearts. Someone who hurt you. Do you still carry the pain? Would you forgive them? Just double your next brain juice cost. <gasps> so, uh, we hit playback on this monitor. Sorry, you guys are going to get very familiar with the camera tilting. Uh, if that is a problem for you, I'm very sorry. Um, <laughs> someone who hurt you. Uh, so we see... We don't see ourselves when we type playback on this monitor. Uh, but we do see our sibling. And like most siblings, you know, we grew up together very happily, very pleasantly. You know, a little bit of sibling rivalry. But somewhere along the way, uh, our sibling just kind of started devaluing the work we were doing. You know, they never really, uh, they never really thought that we were going to be making a lot uh, of change in the world by punching holes in cards to get computers to do things. You know, they, they think it's a waste of time, the, the work we're doing. They think that our... Uh, our particular brain talents uh, would be better spent, you know, making something of value was their exact words. You know, we, we had often argued with them that, you know, computing is of value. There is so much we can do with it. Look at all this stuff. And they just didn't care. They were just like, go make something of value. Go be an engineer. Go be a doctor. You're smart enough for it. Why don't you do it? Why are you wasting your time in that computer lab? You haven't seen the sun in months. And, you know, that that tension is built and built and built over time. And eventually we just screamed at them, you know. We were sick of uh, of the, uh, the continuous, you know, uh, undervaluing of what we were doing. You know, we were very passionate about this. And we were trying to be polite. We were being passionate about their interests. And eventually they just... Uh, they just came at us on a day we were feeling very poorly and uh we just didn't couldn't take anymore and you know the, the 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 video screen in front of us flashes through a bunch of very pleasant memories and then halts on the shot of us our finger pointed in their face you know our our face fuming red and you know in the way that a paused analog video does, it kind of jumps and, and, and then catches and jumps and catches. And it seems like every time, uh, every time the, the video catches itself, uh, our face changes. We still can't really remember our own face, but we can very clearly the, remember the state of our siblings face. You know, they always thought they were just, you know, giving you, uh, giving you kind of a, you know, a ha ha funny, you're not good at what you do, you know, like very joking, uh, ribbing. And, uh, they were not expecting this out of you. You know, we were not a very, uh, we were not a very intense person very often. So they did not see this coming and it really just ruined the relationship we had with us. What was left of the pleasant relationship we had with our sibling. And, you know, we remember this all at once from just this single little image of ourselves, you know, sh ever shifting in front of our sibling. And we shake our head. We don't want to remember this. This isn't, this isn't a good memory. I don't know how much I can remember in all these punch cards. I don't know if I can remember more or more or less of anything. And so we just, 
we quietly, calmly rest our fingers on the keyboard and type delete. That memory is gone. We don't want it anymore. And so we discard this card and never see it again. We don't remember it anymore. And then we will spend a little more brain juice to move to the next card. So I am going to tilt back down. Okay. If anyone is in, is still in chat through the stream just completely giving up, uh, I would love some assistance. Would we like to go to this card? This card? We can move one card around us. We can move to any one card around us right now. So do we want to move up, down, left, right, or on a diagonal? I'm leaning towards moving upward because, you know, if we leave a card behind, we cannot get back to it. So I'm leaning towards moving upward, but if anyone in chat has any particular opinions, uh, feel free to chime in. But uh, while I'm thinking about it, I should probably mention the kind of content warnings for this. Uh, you know, these, I don't intend for this to get too, too horribly cuttingly deep. Um, but, uh, this, this game will, will definitely deal with some themes of potential memory loss because we are trying to prioritize the memories that we want out of ourselves. Uh, so definitely keep that in mind. If that is a difficult topic for you, um, this is not the game for you. You would have loved my turn draw though. <laughs> um, but I just figured I'd keep that in mind pretty close to out front. Now that, now that I've accidentally stumbled into deleting a memory super early, uh, I wasn't expecting to delete a memory that early, but oopsie whoops, I did. I was going to mention it you know, two memories in before we deleted any memories, but we deleted a memory. Oops. So yeah, uh, this may get a little depersonalizing, uh, but that shouldn't be a problem as long as I keep my character to myself. Uh, we gotta keep, we gotta remember I am Amber. You all are along for the ride. I am Amber. Uh, anyway, no one has any opinions. Uh, I don't blame you. So I'm going to move upward for one brain juice. So we spend one brain juice, 22 brain juice. And then we flip on this card and find out what we find on the next terminal. Uh, we go back to that terminal that we were originally uh, considering uh, moving to in the first place because we realized that as soon as we, you know, we, we look back through the memory palace a little bit and realize that after we've interacted with a terminal, it shuts down. The tape stops moving, uh, regardless of whether we are saving it or not. And uh, we realize that, ooh, maybe we need to be careful. So we go back up to the first, uh, the first terminal we were planning on and find on that one, oh wait, no, our next action had double gunk, didn't it? Hang on, rewind. Uh, we just got rid of the 10 of hearts. Uh, double your next brain juice costs. We actually have 21 brain juice. Uh, so we, uh, we recognize these, uh, these terminals shutting down, and we feel something twinge inside of us. We can't remember why, but something we just did took a lot out of us. For a moment, we we maybe uh, stop perceiving the brain palace, and we and we instead see ourselves as a box of punch cards sitting on a shelf, and the cards rattle on the shelf a little bit before we finally settle back into our memory palace. Uh, and find that our next memory is the first person you mourned. When did they leave? Was it your fault? 
What do you wish you could tell them? So, like a lot of people, uh, we approach. So we approach this terminal and find that it is a slideshow of pictures, and it takes us a long moment of thinking to remember who this is, uh, who this was. Like a lot of people, the first person to leave our lives permanently, you know, to pass on was a grandparent and that was very difficult for us you know we had never uh i as amber had never experienced that you know uh and it took a lot we were not in a position i don't know why i keep using the royal we um you know we weren't in a position to distract ourselves with anything with anything mentally stimulating during the funeral so we had to face all of this grief head on and that was really hard uh you know you don't like to put a weight on the people in your life you know you don't like to think about oh i like this person better than i like this person uh but one of the way that we processed this grief initially was to you know kind of mitigate the impact kind of get into the mindset of oh well i still have my three grandparents and i like them all very much uh and that hurt us in the long run uh it was very difficult to get over the get over that idea of well i've still got more people left in my life it, it, just because it minimized the impact of that person on our life our grandparents and we were sitting, our hands stilled on the, stilled on the keyboard, unsure whether we want to interact with this memory, whether we want to keep it. And we realized that regardless of how painful this memory is, that lesson of how to process grief is going to be very important in our coming, our coming lifestyle choices, considering we are you know, rationing the power of our brain and our memories. We're going to need to have the capacity to mourn lost parts of ourself. And we realize that this is also a very important memory. And so we decide to save it. We type, uh, we type ourselves, our, our little uh, save command into the uh oh magnus you're moving the cards buddy um we type our little save command into the keyboard and we 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 squirrel this one away we realize that it is, it is important we should keep it around so we we now have we, we now have 19 brain juice as we step to the next terminal before we reveal what's on the next terminal. We gotta give the cat some love. Hello, Max. What do you think? What do you think of the story we're telling so far? I don't like Amber. They deleted their brother. Yeah. But we don't know that. We're in character. We're just gonna let Magnus sit right here. And it's definitely not gonna cause any problems when I reach up to tilt the camera down. Huh. You're definitely going to stay there. What do you think? Okay. Let me see if I can tilt the camera down without disturbing the lad. I can. So we have saved... Ooh, I'm sorry. The board has all been out of shape because someone decided it was lap time. Uh, so rather than keeping that memory as a core... Oh, you can't even see this. So we decided to not keep that as a core memory but just an important one so it is behind the ace and that's important because we can spend we have to we can theoretically spend memories to gain more brain juice if we're running out buddy you have gunk i know there we go good boy okay so we approach our next terminal 
and the 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 screen takes a moment to flicker on but as soon as it comes on uh, we immediately understand what's on the screen. The Six of Diamonds. As a young person, you got an uncommonly meaningful gift. What is your relationship with the giver? Where did you keep the gift? And what was the gift? I think this is going to tie into our last memory. Uh, you know, these memories have been kind of non-sequential so far, but for once they, rem they remain in sequence as we immediately understand the gravity of the item pictured on screen. Sorry, I'm trying to get the camera correct. Um, we immediately understand the gravity of the, of the item on screen. Uh, it's that grandparent. That grandparent has was the one that uh, was the one that inspired our initial love of engineering and therefore electrical engineering what made us what drove us to become a programmer what probably probably set us on the path to be being in a in a box of cards right now uh and it is an incredibly meaningful gift it was an erector set you know like many budding engineers uh, a toy that lets you build and understand mechanical concepts is very important regardless of when you get it but uh we got this a few weeks before their funeral you know they were not feeling well and they knew it and they wanted to bring some joy into other people's lives and uh, the way that they chose to bring j that joy into your life was this erector set and you know we had built many many thousands of things with it uh, but the thing we the the thing we see that we've built, um, the thing that we see that we've built in this image that is this still image the for for the first time a still image, uh, sitting in front of us, is uh, a card organizer. It's like you turn a crank, and uh, it it shuffles all the cards into one uniform column. And, you know, we used that every day at our job. You know, you after you finish deciding on what what the cards need to look like, you need to put them into the machine, and the machine likes them to be nice. Uh, so we built something out of some, some of that erector set to help us. You know, and we because we wanted to bring something meaningful into our workplace to help us focus on what was what was important. And we remember all of that all at once. You know, it, it's very visceral. And we look at ourselves in the mirror, uh, you know, in the in the mirror of this uh, of this monitor. And we're not sure. This seems important, certainly, but do we need? Would removing this memory, you know, remove anything else tied to it? We're not sure for a moment. And it's really unclear. And finally, we we just grit our teeth and say, I need to say under our breath, I need to remember this. Even if it's not, you know, even if it do, deleting it would not change us, change our drive to make things. Uh, we need to remember the spark that this erector sack gives us and so we decide to keep it we decide to keep the memory of the erector set and we spend another brain juice to save this memory and the room flickers a little bit as we do uh And we, we understand that every time we're trying to remember something, it puts that little bit of strain on our self, on our embodiment. And it becomes that much harder to focus on what we need to what we need to be doing, what is important to us. And even though it would be most advantageous to move one more screen to the right, uh Yeah, even though it'd be most advantageous to move just one more screen to the right so we can try and remember as much as we can, uh, 
we instead stumble forward to this one. So that's 17 brain juice. We just spent two brain juice to remember and move. And we come upon another memory. What's on the screen? It takes it, it takes it a moment to build. Uh it takes it a moment to come up. But eventually we remember that uh, your form is weakened. What detained, depleted, or damaged you? Double your next brain juice cost. Uh, we try to look at this screen. And there's nothing on it. And that concerns us. Are we already losing what little of our sense of self we have? Are we already losing the memories, you know, that we could be saving? And we type playback into the into the keyboard sitting in front of it and nothing happens we blink and nothing happens and we type playback again and the the room shakes the room shifts like it did before when we deleted a memory for a moment we only see a set of uh, a set of punch cards sitting on a shelf and the the room is getting dark around that shelf was the light on did we leave the light on in our office i can't remember immediately we're back into the into the data banks and we look around and there's nothing on the screen why is there nothing on the screen we type playback again and again and again and again and when we finally muster up the understanding that there's nothing here whatever was here has been corrupted uh we've lost some amount of our understanding of ourselves we're tired tired that that seems like a familiar memory tired exhaustion is that why we were here it's so hard to put together and we stumble again to the right Actually, no, we'll, we, we stumble once more downward to another screen. And uh, we lose two brain juice doing it because it's real hard. Because we, we are unused to the strain of, uh, of movement as Amber. As Amber, the, the pile of punch cards. We're not used to this form that we've taken on. And it's concerning. And we stumble again, but thankfully, we find another monitor. Ooh, excuse me. Library has decided to investigate. Sorry, library. Can't be on the table, bud. I'm busy using it. So we stumble to the next monitor, and hopefully we find something there. We find the Eight of Hearts. What does that tell us? Eight of Hearts. 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 Uh, a relative who offered support. How low was your life at the time? Did their offer have strings? We uh, we stumble to the next. We stumble to the next. Uh, the next monitor, the next command line, the next interaction with our self that was, and uh, there is a very specific memory on that screen. Uh, when we first decided to move out west to do this, to move to a place that would let us have the ability to go to this big company's R&D firm so that we could even potentially use a computer, uh, we had no plans. All we knew is we heard about this new computers thing and it sounded really neat, so we moved to... Uh, Where's the, where were the old headquarters of Ma Bell? That'd be a good one. Uh, let me look that one up because that's that's a fun detail to add here. Ma Bell headquarters. Bell System headquarters were in New York. Uh, they were in New York for a long time, and then they were in Dallas, Texas. Yeah, uh, 
Uh, the battle system broke up in the 1980s, but that's fine. Uh, anyway, so we move to New York, to Ma Bell's, uh, hang on, <laughs> let's make sure that's real. Ma Bell R&D location. Bell Labs. Nokia Bell Labs, formerly named Bell Labs until the 90s, AT&T Bell Labs until the 80s, and Bell Telephone Libraries Laboratories from 25, 1925 to 1984 in Murray Hill, New Jersey. So we moved to Murray Hill, New Jersey. And because Murray Hill, New Jersey's uh, main attraction is the Ma Bell R&D place, uh, apartment rent is steep. They know that the people moving here uh, are trying for a job at Ma Bell. So they know that they can charge absurd rent. Well, when we first move here, we don't have a job at Ma Bell, so we can't pay this absurd rent. Uh, one of our extended family members, a cousin, an uncle, an, an uncle's cousin, it's not exactly clear at the time, but they approach us. You know, our mother uh, says to them, you got to help your family out. I can't help them from all the way over here. You're in New Jersey. Please help them. Um... And they do. They approach us and they're like, hey, I will cover first and last rent for this apartment of yours. But I'm going to need you to come over and fix uh, the wiring in my house anytime it starts causing problems. The guy I paid to install this wiring is uh, a buffoon and he wasn't licensed correctly. And this the wiring in my house has been causing problems ever since. I tried to put in a new doorbell, and it, 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 it ain't been working, and it ain't right, and I don't like it. Uh, so, you know, they sucker you into <laughs> helping them with anything in their house. Anytime anything remotely electrical goes wrong in their house, you are pressured into showing up. Several times, it almost loses... Uh, several times, it almost loses us our job at Ma Bell. You know, we we're coming over during a lunch break and they won't let you go or you know we need to go to work tomorrow i need to go home no you didn't do it it, it, it ain't fixed yet you can't go home i i kept i kept you out of the street don't you know and you know that's the wrong accent for new jersey but i don't think i can do a jersey accent um actually i might be able to do a jersey accent who knows uh bonk I kept you out of the streets, you know. That it just ain't right that you ain't helping me. Why aren't you helping me? And uh you know, that's that's kind of a negative memory. They've held it over our heads for our whole life. You know, even when we moved into a moved you know, saved up enough money and moved into a house out there, you know, we still never heard the end of it. They were like, Well, use uh well, you just got your nice fancy house now. Can you keep track of my kids for a little bit? And, you know, that just adds to our exhaustion. That that feeling in the pit of our chest. We had a chest, didn't we? Uh, that the world has been asking a little too much of us. And it's just, it's so difficult to, you know, look back on... Look back on this person who supposedly helped you but has done more to harm you in the process by you know using ever more of your time uh limited time on this earth i guess that limited time's kind of come to an end hasn't it that's a bit rough and once again we you know we look at the difficulty of this negative memory and decide that we don't need it this is one we can let go. It can just stop being something that's a part of us. That's probably fine. You know, it's not like it's the erector set or, you know, it's not like it's the erector set or, you know, something as important as, you know, why we're here. You know, we, we, we know that we're, we were always interested in, making something and computers seem neat and we we remember our friends very well you know we're probably we probably won't forget why we're here if we get rid of this it's fine and we callously type delete into the screen and away the memory goes 
into dust and dust and fuzz in the air that, and it's gone we don't remember it anymore what were we so worried about why were we so tired our job must have been asking a lot of us i mean it was at the biggest telephone magnet in the world and they're looking for something new that'll keep them you know in commercial power they must have just asked a lot of their employees and we move uh, with our mind a little bit more intact than it was before to the next uh, terminal, the one to the right. Ooh, and we we pull the Queen of Diamonds. So face cards cost more to remember because they're important memories. Um, so the Queen of Diamonds, a glimpse of a face, someone who was selflessly kind to you. What did they sacrifice for you? When did you learn the fullness of their acts? So it takes us a long time to remember the face on the screen. Well, first of all, before we get too far into this, we have 14 brain juice. Brain juice. Uh, when we pull four face cards, by the way, the game's over. Uh, just thought I'd point that out. Uh, so it takes us a long time to remember the face that's on the screen. They are seated in a diner. It doesn't look like a very good diner. And we're, we're looking at the screen and we're squinting and we're trying to remember who is this? Why are they important? Until it find until we, and we type playback in hopes of finding out who this person was, why they were important to us. And it all comes together as soon as we hear their voice. They are looking at us with a smile, uh, and we remember immediately. It takes one word from them. Uh, it, it takes two words from them. They say, computers, huh? And we remember everything about them all at once. The, uh, the room beneath our feet shakes and tilts a little bit underneath the force of it all. Uh, but we manage to keep everything together. We don't turn into a set of cards on the shelf for a while. Uh, we managed to keep everything together for now. Uh, we remember how important this person was to us. When we were first coming to, uh, to New Jersey, uh, we were taking a bus out here and we were out of money. We needed one more leg of the Greyhound bus journey. We didn't have any cash. We didn't have any cash to eat. We hadn't eaten anything since we left home because we were trying to save money. And we were ravenously hungry and looking at the bus attendant, like, what am I going to do? I need to get to New Jersey. And this person rolls up. Uh, they are wearing a delicately tailored suit. We never really asked why he was, uh, why he was in a bus station in such a nice suit and tie. He was the type of guy that could have taken a flight, <laughs> you learned later on. Uh, he winds up, you know, he's, he owns shares in a thousand different companies in a thousand different ways. And, uh, he sees, he walks up behind us and, uh, taps us on the shoulder and says, uh, hello there. My name is, uh, what's it, what's a good name for this guy? Uh, Miles... Uh, let's go M.M. -M. Miles, uh, Miles Mordenson. I'm gonna type that so I don't forget it. Miles Mordenson. Uh, so Miles Mordenson, he introduces himself, shakes our hand, and, uh, says, where, where are you headed? And we explain to him, you know, we're heading to the Ma Bell research and development uh center in new jersey and uh he kind of knowingly nods his head and he says uh you having a little cash trouble getting there and uh we, we nod again kind of sheepishly and the the, <laughs> the ticket attendant behind us is kind of like looking over our shoulder like what's happening here uh and he says uh, listen you consider me an investor and he looks over our shoulder 
and says to the ticket taker, uh, when's the when's the next bus to this New Jersey, this place in New Jersey? And the ticket taker explains that we'd have a few hours if you were, if you were to buy the ticket now. And he kind of nods and he says, very good. I will be buying two tickets to there then. One for me and one for this fine young lady. And we kind of blush a little bit. Like, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, and we're, we're very grateful. And, uh, you know, he, he settles up with the ticket taker. And we have our two Greyhound tickets for the both of us. And then he, uh, then he looks at us and he says, you look hungry. Let's go eat something. And that's the image on the screen. Uh, this person, Miles, uh, helped us out when we were in a huge jam. Uh, they were headed the same way we were. Uh, they were, they were a very young, uh, investor that got in on the floor of the newest, uh, the newest level of R&D at Ma Bell, and as an investor of no small cl no small class, you know, uh, he did it with family money he'd earned from a thousand different uh, from a thousand different enterprises. But regardless, you know, he's he's an investor, and he wanted to see what his stock money was paying for, and so he's on his way over there, and lo and behold, he's <laughs> he's paying for a new employee right now. Uh, and we're sitting in this diner and chatting, and it turns out that he's uh, he's a bit of an inventor himself, you know. Uh, his it's run in his family for a long time. They've been all been the sort of people that uh, that build whatever they need if there's not something already existing. And well, they happen to sell something that uh, made a lot of money a long time ago, and he's a little he's a little vague about that. He doesn't exactly want to have the focus be on uh, on what he can do you know he's he's used to the so he's used to the spotlight being a socialite uh you know so he wants to talk about us and we tell him a little bit about ourselves you know we're we've always been the engineering type and we've heard about these new comp newfangled computer things and how much you can do with them and how much you'll be able to do with them in five years and decided that, that that was our uh, our only path forward and uh you know we we've taught we talk for the whole two hours waiting for a bus to mr miles mordenson and then we talk to them you know basically the whole bus ride there and we've made a really close friend from this simple selfless act and uh he says I'll, uh, when we, you know, are departing the bus in New Jersey, he says, I'll, uh, put in a word for you. I think you've got promise. And, uh, we remember that not only did Miles save us at one of the lowest points in our adult life, but he also, you know, basically got us our job at Ma Bell. You know, he's the reason we are even, he's the reason we're even able to be Part of the, we're able to continue being basically because you know deep down we know that whatever circumstances put us in these punch cards they wouldn't have come to be without miles and despite looking around the room and seeing that you know lights in the distance uh are kind of going out and we may not have access to too many more uh memories if we keep saving like this we know we can't let go of who Miles is. He's too important. He's practically a core of who we are. And so we spread, we spend two of our ever dwindling brain juice uh, to save this memory of who Miles is, what he did for us. And then we look around and think for a second. What would be the best way to go so we can try and save everything? I guess go up. And we move to the next terminal. Upward. One. And we spend... We've spent three brain juice to do this because we're saving... We're saving for two and moving for one. So now we have 11 brain juice. And we find another room-shakingly important memory 
on the next screen. This one shakes us hard enough that, again, we see ourselves as as a, a, a deck of cards on a shelf rattling ever closer to the edge in hopes that someone will catch us and notice us. A glimpse of a face, a respected teacher. What mistake was unforgivable? What did you give up in order to learn? We weren't always going to be an engineer. For a while, we had a different dream. Still a large dream, but a different dream. We thought that we were going to be a performer. We thought we were a great actor. We thought, I can do this. And for many years, we, for many years as a child, we thought we had it. You know, we always hit the books just in case it wouldn't work out. And, but for many years, our focus was acting. And uh, we even had private acting lessons with a retired actor. Some, some D-list movie name. You know, we don't... Most people wouldn't know who they are based on their roles alone. You know, if you mentioned how many movies they were in, they'd go, oh, yeah, I kind of know who they are. But... Uh, that didn't matter to us. What mattered to us was that they were teaching us to act, te teaching us to go with the flow of the scene and understand the the way that our line reads affected everything. You know, all the little intricacies of not only camera acting, but stage acting. And then we remember the hard part of this memory. It's difficult to face it's it's difficult to face immediately, but we recognize the oncoming trouble in this memory. Uh, and though we can't remember our teacher's face very well, we do remember how things went wrong. It's always been bad luck to mention Macbeth in a theater. You know, it's just an old theater tradition. And you're supposed to spit if you mention the Scottish play on stage. Uh, we didn't do that. We were talking to somebody in the wings, waiting for, you know, some bit part in a community theater that our teacher had gotten us, and we offhandedly mentioned Macbeth. Nobody told us about this weird old stage tradition, but for once, that tradition held some water. For once, uh, the problem coming was technically our fault. Our teacher is chewing the scenery, remembering his time as an important cinema actor, uh, ironically, uh, as one of the characters in The Phantom of the Opera. You know, he, he... And one of the things about Phantom... Wait, no, that's an anachronistic. Phantom wasn't a show at the time. I don't think. Uh, okay, it's not Phantom, but it's a show with an elaborate effect for community theater. Uh, what would have been? A, I I have no. I don't know enough theater history to know what was popular with seventies community theater. Uh, but a sh a show that a community theater reasonably probably shouldn't have been doing because of the compl complication of the effects. And. They hadn't tested the effect uh, before the opening night. It was some kind of chemical firework type thing. It was rigged to only work three nights for how long the play was running, and so they couldn't test it. And they didn't test it. No, oh, it's fine. We trust the we trust the chemistry there, right? Right? But some something somewhere hears us mention Macbeth and smiles a cruel smile for when this chemical grenade essentially goes off, it doesn't go off correctly. And it strikes our teacher in the chest as they are gearing up for some oratory explosion, you know, to go along with the effect. And some... Some, some some chemical process occurs as they're struck in the chest. And 
you know, we flash forward a few days. They are laying, in, our teacher is laying in a hospital bed. There's bandages around their throat. And they, they see us and they beckon us closer. Because they can hardly speak anymore. That's what happened. Whatever chemical nonsense went on, uh, it made our teacher lose their voice permanently. And they beckon us closer. And we lean in, trusting them. And he says, with the, what little force his voice can muster anymore, You've always been a horrible actor. And he coughs in our ear, and we... <laughs> and that wound to our pride stopped us from becoming a theater actor. Knowing that, to some degree, our teacher blamed us for what happened and knowing that unknowingly we caused the end of an illustrious career uh for someone so important to us it it wounded us forever and it set us on our path away from uh away from theater and onto uh onto more intellectual uh, more uh traditionally intellectual pursuits, that sort of engineering mindset, we uh, we knew we couldn't do that anymore. We thought we were going to be a child actor? Really? No. And we give up that dream. And we look at the, we look at the monitor, and we sit back, and we wonder, well, that part of our life didn't do anything for us. Not in our current, you know, not our current state. We were. We wound up being doing engineering anyway. It was that was going to be a side hobby. What if we forget this bad man? What if we just let it go? And much like so many dark memories that we've stumbled upon, before, uh, we do let it go. We breathe out, and shake our head, and type delete, and what should be a core memory is gone. What should be some important core of who we are is just blown away like so much dust in a windstorm. And we move to another terminal, smiling happily, unawares that we've removed something that is potentially important to us. And we find, at this terminal, the Four of Clubs. Uh, there is something familiar about your current form. How would it fit, with, fit in with your old life? What unexpected benefit would it give you? So, weirdly, we see, essentially, a self-portrait on, uh, on this screen. We see a, we see a deck of uh, punch cards sitting on a shelf in uh, what used to be our office that seems to have been forgotten in the shuffle. Uh, for one reason or another, uh, the people cleaning out our office decided to leave the punch cards on a shelf. Uh, everything else has, you know, been cleaned out and passed around to our, uh, our surviving friends and family, but these punch cards, you know, they were technically company property, you know, it's, it, even though it's proprietary work that was ours, you know, the, the company got a hold of it, so they're sitting on a shelf as cold storage, and around this box of punch cards, you know, let's, let's be real, it's probably something about this big. Uh, around this box of punch cards is a little interference in the picture, and we tap the two, we reach, we try to reach upward with our hand, and as we reach forward into the television, uh, as we reach forward to the screen, we see that our hand isn't quite substantial as it fizzes out into the screen, and nothing, nothing comes of it, we're, we're fine, but 
we realize that uh, despite all our best efforts to remember who we are here, we are now not human anymore. We are a deck of cards. We are a deck of we are a series of a set of information with something that's not quite well understood attached to it. And we realize that, you know, not all bad. Now we're definitely meaningful. <laughs> you know, even if we're shuffled, you know, someone can get some kind of uh, information out of what we are now. Who knows, maybe we'll attract a paranormal investigator. Maybe someone will resurrect our code into something else and we'll be able to move out of these cards. Who knows what's next, what's coming, you know? Uh, you've heard that I, 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 we've heard that there's been advances in memory lately. Somebody was talking about how they were literally knitting memory out of wires the other day. That doesn't sound like it's going to pan out. Why not just use paper tape and magnetic spools and wire? But who knows where the world's going to go? And we realize that from our position on this shelf, uh, we'll eventually be able to see technology change much, much more than the average person, especially if our company, if the company we were working for stays in the technology business, we'll be able to see the world change in a much different way than the average person. And we kind of smile to ourselves and we see on the, on the, uh, on the box of punch cards, uh, written in a very hasty scrawl, our first name, Amber. And we smile and we nod and we say, say to ourselves, yeah, I want to remember why the form I'm in now is so good. I'm going to need it if I'm going to sit here. Uh, if I'm going to sit here as a, a, a deck of punch cards storing a pattern that people may or may not remember, I'm going to need to remember why that's a good thing. And we decide to remember that. And so we do. We take the four of clubs and we put it in our memory banks. And we move one terminal to the right. And there we find the two of diamonds. So what do the two of diamonds tell us about ourself? Once you loved or tried to love, what would keep you from your first encounter? Did they love you in return? So, you know, any time we, any time you move any amount, it's difficult to keep in touch with people. And that was especially true moving from, you know, from downtown LA, or not downtown LA, uh, from a small town in California all the way across the country to New Jersey for this engineering job. Uh, and you tried your best to keep in touch with a lot of people from home, but the, the biggest, the person that you tried to hold on to the longest was, uh, was your friend named, uh, sorry, I'm trying to think of a name real quick. You know what? It was considering the time period, this is probably not too anachronistic a name. Uh, your friend named Sapphire. Uh, you know, usually that wound up shortened something, usually Saf. Uh, but you know, she always lamented her mom's hippy dippy choice of name. Like, what? Who names their kid Sapphire? I guess my mom. And you know, you had been close friends with Sapphire for a long time, even despite as you you know grew up into different things. Uh, you know, let's make it even spicier. Uh, Sapphire is the person you were talking to when you mentioned Macbeth, and she decided to stay in the theater industry. Uh, she decided to to see how far she could go as an actress. And for a long time, you know, uh, Sapphire and Amber 
traded back and forth phone calls and you know long distance phone calls must have been expensive at the time but hey i'm employed at i'm employed at a telephone company it's fine i definitely don't uh cheat the payphone out of a uh, perfectly good i definitely don't cheat the payphone out of perfectly good long distance calls uh uh and that you managed to keep in touch with sapphire for a long time and then one day we we go home for christmas or we go home for a holiday of some kind and uh we try to express how important we are, that sapphire is to us to her and she misunderstands for one reason or another she becomes uncomfortable something about what we said that we can't remember the exact details of it makes her uncomfortable and slowly but surely the phone calls and the letters they stop coming in and the last thing we get from them is a wedding invitation a wedding invitation for a wedding that we were too busy to go to go uh to go to and wait a minute we you know lean into the screen and find that the the date on that wedding invitation is pretty close to the last the last few things we remember before being who we are now why didn't we go again were we too were we too busy and we think for a second you know sapphire is not uh is someone who's in several other memories. We don't want to break anything by not remembering her, right? Even if it's hard to remember that we've drifted apart, we need to remember that. And so we again spend a little brain juice, squeeze a squeeze, squeeze the brain juice out of the play, out of the punch cards. And uh, we decide to save uh those memories of of sapphire she's important we need to keep her around and so now we move to another terminal slightly to the right and we have nine brain juice left and as we move to the terminal to the right uh we notice that uh the room's getting kind of fuzzy we try to adjust some glasses that aren't on our face anymore we spend a, a, a few moments uh you know we we spend a few moments trying to find a ladder to kind of jostle some of these light bulbs back into working but it doesn't really do much we can't see super far we're we're losing our hold on something and it's not we can't i don't uh, uh next next memory i'll be fine The five of hearts. What's on the screen? As we're trying to shake our head to clear our vision, uh, the screen resolves uh, in front of us. And we see someone who trusted you. Did you deserve their trust? Was it reciprocated? Uh, I think we're going to call back to Miles again. Uh, we trusted Miles with a lot with that debt that he gave us, you know, with any number of ideas that he could have taken off to another company and gotten us in a lot of trouble, uh, with, <laughs> with becoming a sounding board for the difficulties in our life. You know, when, when Sapphire slowly stopped talking to us, uh, you know, we, we, we ran to miles. We said, you know, what, what do you think I did wrong? Uh, didn't I, didn't I make it clear that they were important to me? Why are they drifting apart? You know, Miles was not just someone who saved our life. He was also someone who was our, a close confidant of ours. We, we earned his trust and he earned ours and it was all very meaningful. And in, at the end of the day, we sit back and think about it we both deserved each other's trust as much as we could you know he's he's 
basically saved your life and you've done so much for him that that bond of mutual trust is important but we again look around look around the room watch you know the lights flickering the tape drives slowing everything that that low hum that pervades the room slowly detuning and we get a little nervous get a little concerned and we decide that we already have something else to remember remember miles by we're sure we'd remember how important he is even without this right right and before we can waffle any further on the decision our fingers fly across the keyboard delete and the memory drifts away like tears in rain to steal a philip k dick line uh and we stumble to the next terminal uh feeling the bags under our eyes <laughs> coalesce on our somewhat electric, somewhat ectoplasmic, somewhat data-based form now. Uh, you know, we we are coming to terms with the fact that we are a ghost. A ghost in a machine. A ghost... Well, a ghost that could be put in a machine. Not necessarily a ghost fully in the machine right now. And as we're coming to grips with that, we look down and find that the little deck of punch cards is uh, is split in half, and it's our feet as we walk. And the cards shuffle a little bit with each step we take, and we look upward at our own body and realize that we're just kind of a ghost, a, a, a hologram, if you will, uh, a spirit media... Uh, of a vision of a spirit medium uh, projected from these two cards. And we realize that uh, our legs are getting a little weak. You know, we can barely see the tips of our fingers. Things are getting uh, a little dicey. We, we approach the next terminal, trying to put out of our mind the strain of not... Uh, the strain of trying to hold together all the memories we have. And the next terminal has the six of hearts on it. The six of hearts. An artist who moved you. What was their chosen medium? How did it make you feel? So electronic music was, you know, very much a hobby of yours. Uh, you know, and it's difficult to get much more than squelches and screeches. You know, it, but to incorporate some volume of electro electricity into the production of music was entirely possible. I mean, look at, you know, theremin and, you know, electric motors and the like. Uh, the electrification of music was a core, was something fascinating to you. And uh, oh, I just clicked something that I didn't mean to click. Stop that. Okay. Uh, and you know it's 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 occasionally difficult to get a hold of recorded music uh, outside of a vinyl. You know there there wasn't a lot of commercial application uh, for audio tape quite yet. Uh, but you know you 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 have your ways. You find your way around, uh, and you you find the works of an electronic musician. Uh, let me... I have a specific name in mind. Wendy Carlos, I believe is who I'm thinking of. Yes. Wendy Carlos, that's who I'm thinking of. Uh, a, a personal favorite of ours is Wendy Carlos. And you know it's it's difficult to find and pinpoint specific recordings, but you, we have developed a very specific ear for Wendy Carlos's work. She she's been known to do a lot of uh, 
she's been known to do a lot of film scores and it and you know much like any engineer we're kind of a big nerd about sci-fi and you know we very quickly develop an ear for uh carlos's scores and love it you know when we have the spare brain power to have some music going while we're writing out the next chunk of logic uh Carlos's scores were a constant companion when we could spare the brain power to have them on without uh, that eating up too much of our brain, you know. And we'd invested in, you know, various ways to play those back, whether it's a nice record player or something, you know, fancy and cutting edge. And it was also one of the few sources of, uh, few sources of leisure time other than that canasta game that we had was enjoying their her scores and we really really liked them and despite uh despite the way that we're beginning to sway in our own stance and lose the tips of our fingers we pause for a moment and wonder if this is something we do need to remember I mean, engineering's inherently a creative act. You need a muse, don't you? Right? Yes, definitely. And so without a second thought, we choose to remember Carlos's uh, score, scoring work. And that becomes one of our memories that we still have. And we stumble to the next terminal, our fingers getting weaker, our eyesight getting fuzzier all the while. Six brain juice. And we pull uh we pull ourselves into a sterner stance as we approach this uh next screen. And find on this next screen uh the four of spades, a joy from a coworker. How is it beautiful? Uh, why did it remain? Uh, I think this is this is a very specific sort of joy. I think it is uh, handing the joy of handing punch cards off to uh, the the uh, what's the word I'm looking for secretary i suppose the the handler of the of the data entry let's say the handler for sure and there's a very specific joy in giving uh this particular you know you you give a little bit of yourself every time you finish something and need to see the result of something and it feels like you're giving a little bit of yourself to this person each time. And, you know, they don't have a lot of time to chat because they're ferrying cards back and forth and pairing them with readouts and making sure that the cards are in the specific order, you know, making sure the whole marker line is traced correctly and making sure they don't drop any punch card blocks or anything. They're, they're very busy, but in this, in the few stray chats that we, we have with this person, with the, with the, uh, with the card wrangler, uh, we get to know them a little bit. They seem very nice. They seem like they uh, they seem like they have a great uh, a great appreciation for what's happening here, uh, and they do their best to try to kind of try to ex understand uh, whatever inquiries you give them. It's sometimes hit or miss, but you know still inquiries helpful uh and we realize that all at once we realize that our partner in those canasta games that we played you know every friday night it was the it was the handler of those punch cards no wonder we trusted them so much and we hope you know we look down at our little punch card feet and hope that one day they'll put us in the machine again to see the way the world has changed. We kind of smile to ourselves and think about this. 
We definitely need to remember them, right? Just out of sheer hope that they remember us. We need to remember them. And we we look at the we look at the little screen in front of us as it loops that little moment of handoff over and over. And each time the loop changes a little bit, it's a different set of cards each time, but it's the same sort of memory, compressed. And we kind of nod and say to ourselves that we really need to save that too, right? Definitely. And we move to the next terminal, move down to the next terminal, and in moving and saving, we've uh, really, we're really... Uh, getting low on the tank here our fingers barely have enough substance to type on the next keyboard to show the next uh to show the next video uh our the the details of our face are a wash in a haze of static we're beginning to lose ourselves. we're beginning to lose everything but the memories we've been holding together and the next memory shows itself on our screen. The Five of Clubs. Let's see what that is. Five of Clubs. Your form could be broken or damaged. What's the way it could protect itself? How easily could you repair it? We see... We see on the screen... Many possible futures. And we recognize, as a fan of science fiction, that they are many possible futures. It's not guaranteed that something could knock us on the shelf and disarrange us. It's not guaranteed that something could come for the building and light it on fire and burn us. You know, it's not guaranteed that someone trying to degauss their computer... What's degauss? We don't know, but... Someone trying to degauss their computer screen could dispel the ghost within the cards. Someone could leave us on a shelf. Some moths could change the pattern of holes. We see a hundred thousand ways, a hundred thousand different ways that we could be destroyed or erased. But we also recognize that these cards are not the only way that we are, that the program that contains us is written down anymore there are your there are your notes somewhere you know there's outputs previous outputs from this program that you know along with whatever errata and outputs it spits out it also spits out a version of the code you know written out in as close to plain text as was possible at the time you know there this is not the only listing of instructions that there that is identical to your current form Worst comes to worst, us as a ghost could learn to move to one of those other duplicates. And who knows, you know, someone could input us into something a little uh, more volatile, and we could shift places. You know, in, in one of those potential futures we see, we don't quite understand what this little gray stick is, but... If we seem to be attached to it, it doesn't make much sense. And looking at the lack of resolution our form continues to have, looking around the room as our memory palace, you know, continues to crinkle and crunkle, and, you know, little bits of rubble come down from the ceiling, we realize that we don't need to try and hold on to a thousand different potential futures worth of memories. We'll definitely remember that this wasn't the only copy of these punch cards, right? This wasn't the only copy of our code. We'll definitely remember that. You know, everybody says if you've got one, if you've got none, we'll definitely remember that. So we choose to forget those many potential ways that we could save ourselves in the case of some kind of destructive future. We only spend one brain juice moving, so we've got three brain juice. And things get a, continue to get more precarious, but less precarious than they than they did last time we tried to remember something. But as we stumble up to the next uh, 
the next monitor, we realize that uh, this next memory is important, direly important. It's something that we really, really shouldn't forget. A glimpse of a face, a colleague who left. What remained unfinished? How are you incomplete? So, like many programmers, we were not the only person to be working on uh, this final piece of code that has become ourself. Uh, we had a partner in our uh, in our endeavors. What's their name? Uh, Gail. Um, what's his last name? Gail Simmons, let's say. Gail Simmons. So his name's Gail Simmons, and we see Gail's face, just a snippet of it, pass us by, and we see, you know, a thousand times that we've brought, you know, printouts of the code before it gets fed onto punch cards uh, to Gail, like, hey man, can you look this over for me? Uh, I know you're sharper at seeing why this might not work come step through this with me, you know, we're standing in front of a whiteboard, we, we've we got a hundred notebooks laid all over a table, we're working out just what exactly could go wrong with this, and we realized that, <laughs> you know, Gale was instrumental in producing the form that we have now. He might be, you know, one of the, despite our difficulty in remembering, you know, Despite our, we, we struggle to remember for a moment, but, but am I the only, is this the only punch cards? Gail would know. Gail would know. I don't know. I don't remember anymore like I am, and I don't know if I could reach out to Gail, but Gail would know. So I need to remember Gail so I can actually talk to him. He, he wouldn't be the type to interact with a ghost if, 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 if it wasn't provably me. You know, he's too superstitious. And so we decide that we really, really need to remember Gale. He's he's important. He was a partner in crime, and he may be the key to continuing to exist after these punch cards are obsolete. And so we spend two of our brain juice to uh, remember Gale. And we're down to one brain juice. And we try to take a step. And the world spins. Everything stops making sense for a moment. Uh, we are just a pile of cards on a desk, a pile of cards in a box, a pile, a, a sheaf of paper in someone's binders, uh, a bunch of random notes, a, a little gray stick that we don't quite understand, and we struggle. Uh, I got it. No, I'm okay. I can hold it. It's fine. I'm good. Ah! And eventually we manage to retain our form and realize that we can't move. If we try to move and remember more, we won't make it out of here. And it takes us a long time of, you know, tentatively moving and, you know, tr looking at the memories we've held dear uh, you know, over and over before we realize that if we give up a little bit of our memory, we'll be able to dig further into who we were. And that's for the best, right? That's important. Definitely. And we, we pause for a moment. And we think about we, we we think about the memories that we've kept in particular. What could we give up? Could we give up the the idea of that grandparent who inspired us to be an engineer? We've got enough, you know, load bearing information, so to speak, to continue to be interested in engineering, maybe, but it's it's our it's our grandparent. That's not good. Or, you know, the, the memory of the memory of, uh, what's their name? Apologies, I am bad at names. 
the, the memory of Wendy Carlos's scores, surely we'd be able to recall who we are without, you know, something as passé as a cultural touchstone, right? Or, you know, even worse to consider, even though we just nearly sacrificed everything to try and remember Gail or how much we've, how much energy we put into remembering, uh, hang on, who is this? Uh, how much energy we put into remembering Miles. We've got other supporting memories of when we, when we met Miles. We can get rid of that, right? Right, right, right. It's fine. This is fine. And, you know, we don't dig too much further into our memories before we realize that it's probably for the best to let that memory of the grandparent who inspired us go. They've, they've passed on. We've got enough of ourself to save, to continue on. And we return to where this terminal was shuffling each step we try to return to where this terminal was our each step shuffling struggling before realizing no we can't move we're gonna have to type it into the uh terminal in front of us and we it takes us a little bit of uh, poking around to understand before we finally type delete three uh, delete three h and whatever system runs this memory palace understands and the screen flashes completely white for a moment and when we come to we have a much fuzzier sense of self but we have a much fuzzier understanding of our past but we have a much stronger physicality now Library, please. I'm going to need you to leave the cards alone. Thank you. Uh, and it... The memory flashes across our mind in that, in that flash of the screen. We remember everything that we had done with that grandparent. You know, how much effort they had spent, uh, you know, making sure that we had the drive to do something do something um do something that they think they think is productive along with something that we think is, pro is along with something that we thought is creative and we let those memories go they too disappear like the ones that we refused to remember and find that consuming that memory literally has given our body structure once more. Uh, the the punch cards at our feet look like look much more organized. Our whole body seems to be there much more than it was before, and we return to eleven brain juice and uh, made more sturdy by uh, that by that effort of forgetting something to continue to be we step to the next terminal yep library library buddy you, you can't roll the dice right now give it a minute we step to the next terminal our feet shaking because we're concerned for our health now and uh we find that this terminal reaches out as we reach out to it too uh, this terminal clamps onto our wrists, and we understand immediately that that this thing has us, that whatever mechanism is going on here, this is the last thing we get to do. Uh, this is the last thing we get to do before we can inhabit the real world. This is the last memory we get to choose to keep. Uh, and sure, we could, we could struggle to 
wander around and try and remember more, but there's no reason to tarry about much longer, is there? Let's just remember what this last little piece of ourself and see if we can get people to get us into a, a little bit more stable of a position instead of a deck of cards teetering on the edge of a shelf. The Queen of Spades, our last memory. A glimpse of a face, a true friend. What brought you happiness together? Was there ever a spark of romance? Do we still remember Sapphire? We still remember Sapphire, so we're good. Um, after Sapphire stopped talking to us, um, you know, which was a real blow, uh, we had to find new friends, new friendships. Uh, you know, we were, we were always spending so much time talking to the people back in California that we didn't have that much time. But now that we have all this time, well, we can keep another friend, right? And, uh, you know, once again, we don't remember how we met them. It was something we were doing. It's not exactly clear anymore, but it was some hobby we enjoyed, but we don't remember that we enjoyed anymore. And we were out doing whatever that was when we met them. Uh, what was their name? Their name was, uh, oh God, names. Uh, their name was Bartholomew. Uh, hmm, I need a last name. I need a last name. Bartholomew Smith. Yes, definitely a real name. Uh, we met Bart Smith at, we try to remember where and we can't. And whatever we were doing, uh, Bart took a real shine to us. Uh, while we were doing it. He was never, you know, the intellectually minded person that we were. Uh, he was more of a, he was more of a poet. Uh, he was, he was the, he was the, th he was the uh, leader of the local theater, uh, the local community theater. And uh, we struggle to remember for a moment. Oh yeah, community theater. Uh, we used to like to do that. We can't do it anymore, but hey, we've got Bart to live vicariously through. Uh, and we were really fast friends because of it. And, you know, things seemed to be progressing a little bit beyond friendship. There was that, that, uh, that little hint of, uh, something more, but we'd always hesitated. Our job takes so much time and Bart's so busy at the community theater, keeping everything spinning, especially on that little money. So we were both always a little nervous to try and act on any of those feelings that we potentially had. But, you know, we were, that's right. That's what I was doing before, before everything changed. I was getting, I was about to go home and get ready to go on our first date with Bart. And, you know, that, that, uh, that excitement pulsing through us just ate up more of our energy than we were expecting. And then we remember we remember what killed us. It was just sheer overwork. We'd been working too long of hours at at the Bell Labs, and we were too excited about getting to go see getting to go see Bart and see where things could have gone. And that last little uh, that last little memory clicks into place with the help of us remembering Bartholomew Smith. Uh, that the last thing we were doing was finishing this program. What was it? What was it designed to do? It was designed to attach to a, a computerized speaker and play arbitrary music, and that was incredibly difficult for the time. You know, they had to. You would have to devise a way to. That was an incredibly difficult project. You know, we had to devise a way to put in sheet music that worked with the existing punch card. Thank goodness there were those um, there were those piano rules to work from, and you know, we had to devise a way to tell the speaker in real time with a computer what to do. And 
how to do it and when to do it. And just as soon as we were getting ready to, uh, you know, I was trying to talk Bartholomew into coming over here before, uh, before we went out because this was all a surprise for him. And uh, we were so excited to finally test it. And uh, the, the sheer excitement of uh, hitting the button and the first note coming out of the speaker correctly in front of Bart, the excitement got to us. All that, all that stress of all that overwork is slowly aggravated a weak heart that we didn't know we had. Uh, and it just did us in. We, uh, the program continued to run, the cards flowing out of the machine into an orderly pile, and we clutched our chest and looked at Bart and said, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be back. And tried to take a step forward and fell into those cards as they ran out of the machine, falling on our head over and over in a repetitive rhythm as this this tune that we had written ourselves the first music we had written in probably the better part of a decade uh issued from the speakers and something about the emotional the emotionally charged moment merging with something new being something some new effect being created for the first time out of something that's already really so new it bound us to these punch cards and we find and we find ourselves as we leave the uh as we leave our memory palace sitting on the shelf you know as a as something with a vague corporeality at best uh looking out onto the world and uh we we look back we look we look within ourselves to you know remind ourselves what we are what we remember what we recall and we'll start from the bottom up with clubs let's say so the four of clubs reminds us that uh that just because we are a ghost possessing a series of cards doesn't mean that that's the, uh, wait, I'm reading the wrong one, aren't I? Four of clubs. No, 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 that is. There's something familiar about your old life. How would it fit in with your old life? What unexpected benefit would it give you? Uh, we remember that we are, we are just an unbroken pattern. We could be duplicated. We could be saved, even if these cards themselves break down. Uh, the familiarity of the work that we put in to produce this based on everything else you know it, it it defined our life especially the latter part of it and then the ace of clubs is just uh look at your current physical form what's keeping your mind intact are there any organic parts of you left how do you feel uh and we look down at the the stack of cards sitting next to us that we know is the current way that we're represented and we kind of are excited that uh, the only thing holding us together is the simple concept of the cards sitting next to us and nothing, you know, nothing organic has to remain other than, I guess, if you call a soul organic, you know, the, the soul of our idea can live on regardless. And it's very comforting to know. And then we'll move on to the diamonds next. We look back upon uh, we look back upon the the great uh, the wonderful things that Miles Mortensen had done for us. You know, between getting us our job and getting us to the job in the first place, and just all the other selfless things that we did for each other over our lifetimes. Uh, you know, it was very. It was very pleasant to know that we had such a, a a lifelong friend with which we had a friendship that was so easy, so simple, you know, born out of something so selfless that 
things couldn't change that much more for the worse. And the Nine of Diamonds reminds us that uh, we were part of a community. Uh, we were part of a community and we were closest to those people that we played cards with, fittingly. Uh, you know, the, those many, many games of Canasta, you know, the, the, the trash talk, the money won and lost, the sheer adrenaline of it all. And it's silly to think about, it's silly to consider that we're getting any kind of adrenaline out of a card game, but it's just so pleasant. It was such a great time, and you hope that, uh, you hope that, uh, brain loading, one moment, we, we hope that Gale can find us so that we can live on not only through the pattern, but also through our our friend's enjoyment of something so simple. In the Ace of Diamonds, when they took your old body, you lost everything but for one keepsake. Did you choose it or did they? Do you know what it means or do you need to explore more? Uh, I think the one thing that, other than the punch cards that's keeping us, you know, together, is the box that's keeping the punch cards together. Uh, you know... And it's no, it's no ordinary card box. It's been, it's been drawn on. It's been written on many times. It's, it's elaborately decorated, and in it are a collection, a collection of five lucky, lucky rubber bands. Um, and those rubber bands kind of represent your ability to hold yourself together now. Uh, and we're, we're very pleased with that. You know, those, those rubber bands were the ones we put on things that were that need a little luck to run correctly. And now they're a part of us, basically, forever. What an important keepsake, you know? And the six of diamonds. As a young person, you got an uncommonly meaningful gift. We, uh, we flash back to, uh, we flash back to that director set that, uh, wait a minute, did I not? forget that? What's the Three of Hearts then? Uh, hang on. Brain loading. Three of Hearts. Ah, so we can't remember who gave us this Erector set, but we know that whoever it was gave it to us in hopes that we would foster a love of creativity that is a sort of creative productivity, so to speak. You know, the ability to understand the patterns that arise in the world and how to use them. And it's what put us down this path to become this deck of cards now. Uh, the Two of Diamonds, lastly, spurs us to remember once you loved or tried to love. We flash back to... We flash back to Sapphire. Uh, despite them having left from our life uh, because of the lack of, you know, reciprocation of that love, uh, they were still such an important part of our, of our life that we couldn't let them go even now that we are nothing more than some ectoplasm and some text on a, text on a pile of index cards. We couldn't let go of them. They were too important to us. She was too important to us. And so now we'll remember her forever. And in some way, you know, they say you you die for the last time when someone forgets your name. Well, we'll always remember Sapphire's name. And as long as somebody's keeping us up to date so we can get access, uh, our program can get access, we, I should say, uh, then Sapphire will live on forever with us too. Along with Gale and Miles for that matter. You know, they those three people were so important to us that now they get some kind of little portion of our strange, strange immortality. The uh, hearts next recall to us that the last friendly person you saw with your old eyes, what secrets did you keep together what do you miss most about them? We flash once again to Gale and 
we realize that they were in he was in fact the last person we saw with our with our old you know flesh eyes there were a hundred secrets a thousand secrets we kept between each other you know what what they're pl what he was planning next whether something would work uh, what he was planning next for the theater, whether something would actually work, you know, how good or bad that audition actually was. A hundred thousand little secrets kept between each other throughout the, the path of our life. And we realized that we miss, uh, what we missed most about him is his laugh. You know, we, uh, we sit with ourselves for a moment and realize we can't clearly recall him laughing and we really really need to see him again to make him laugh with a joke to remember that even if it takes a little bit out of us to try and add some new memory and six of hearts reminds us of an artist that uh that moved us It reminds us of Wendy Carlos's incredible, incredible scores, and we. It reminds us that uh, she basically scored the. Uh, she basically scored the path to the end of our life. You know, uh, we based the composition that that this program was designed to put out on a lot of her work. So it's it's very important to us that she uh, that she's remembered by us in particular. And last but not we least are the spades. We gotta call a spade a spade and remember these last few things that we chose to recall. A glimpse of a face, a true friend. What brought you happiness together? Was there ever spark of romance? Again, our mind turns back to Gale. You know, our tr our truest friend. Uh, you know, a, something maybe even something more. We don't know if Gale will be willing to, you know, still see what could happen between us in a form like this. But either way, we'll be happy to see him again. And the Jack of Spades. Uh, a colleague who left. Uh, who was the colleague who left? He was the, uh, he was the, our partner in crime. The one, uh, no wait, that was, sorry, the Queen of Spades was Bart Smith. Gail Simmons is the Jack of Spades. Apologies, I'm I'm losing the memory of this story as we're recalling it. Oh no, uh oh. Let's hope that doesn't bode poorly for my continued existence. I know exactly who I'm haunting if I'm a ghost though, but that's beside the point. Uh Gail, our partner in writing this program, he owns a little piece of what makes us immortal now, and that makes our heart shine. Uh, a specific small task, the Ace of Spades, a specific small task that brought you joy in your work. Did you have to do it? Who knew about your contribution? So, one of the specific small tasks that we had to do in work was, you know, occasionally making sure that not only our work was organized, but everybody else's too. You know, making sure that something we did didn't leave something in memory that would break somebody else's work. And... You know, that, that was something we always liked. We, we liked to interact with our fellow electrical engineers, our fellow programmers, uh, to make sure that we weren't breaking anything by trying to run this crackpot program that we've written that will make music with a computer. How weird. And, you know, that, that sense of community and camaraderie was something we really enjoyed, despite it being a lot of time away from the world and our last memory that we come to rest upon is a joy from a co-worker uh how is it beautiful how did it remain uh i don't remember what we did for that card so i'm going to do pull a comics and retcon that this last scene we're about to do erases this memory 
in place of what we are remembering from Bart. So as we reflect on all of these, uh, all of these memories that we've chosen to hold on to, uh, we finally, we realize that it's a little lonely on this shelf. Somebody really needs to get us. And we think, we think for a long time, you know, ghosts are able to contact people from beyond ways that make sense, right? So we think real hard, we think real, real hard, and eventually we managed to get a hold of Bart. What was he doing? Wasn't important, but he notices, you know, a few choice words in turn, uh, and it reminds him to go back to Ma Bell and grab those punch cards, you know? I can't believe I forgot those punch cards. They were the last thing that Amber did for me. Why would I ever leave them on a shelf there? And he, you know, storms his way into the lab and it's very dramatic and bang, opens the office door and uh, hastily bars it behind him. <laughs> and, he, and he picks up the cards and all at once he feels that we, Amber, are in those cards, are here. And we kind of smile a little bit at him. And, uh, and we and we look at him and and say, uh, "Hey, Bart, I know I know you're busy, but I, I I've been sitting here on this shelf and I have the best joke." And he's like, "This is not the good. This is not a good time for a joke. Please, please, Amber, not a good time for a joke. I gotta tell the joke, please." And uh, <laughs> despite our best efforts, we can't hold out. We can't hold off telling this joke. It's too bad. We can't hold off on telling the joke. Sorry, Bart. And we go, we, we lean into his ear and we go, Hey, Bart. And Bart's like, oh, What? What, what does a 500 pound canary say? And he's like, I don't know, Amber. What does a 500 pound canary say? Bang, bang, bang on the door. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. And we both, you know, absolutely lose it laughing. You know, maybe it's the tension of the situation. Maybe it's just because the joke is just that. It's so bad, it's good. But Bart loses himself laughing, too, for a moment. And as, as you know, the security for Bell Labs drags him out of there, they don't notice that he's holding a deck of... <laughs> A deck of punch cards. They're too busy being like, what are you doing in here? Why are you here? Are you a corporate spy? And he's too busy laughing at our joke. And that's the last, like, that is what we sacrificed to always remember that. Mo you know, we sacrificed whatever this memory was to always remember that moment, no matter what, going forward. That one pure moment of humor and laughter and joy with someone who... Could have been a, a life partner. I think that's a very positive note to end this story on. Sure, Amber continues as a pattern throughout the future, but I'll leave those stories up to you. Does she get put on a flash drive somewhere? Is she, is she uploaded to archive.org? Does she see the internet at large? Is she in a chatbot somewhere? Who knows? That's up to you if you'd like to expand on that story magnus thank you but for those of you curious the cards we had left on the table uh let me arrange them a little bit these were the cards we had left on the table if we had not stumbled into that last uh that last face card we probably could have used one two three four five six we could have used seven of those brain juice we sacrificed a memory for. Uh, so that's just, you know, that's something that could have been, but wasn't. Anyway. Uh, I think that brings to a close the story of Amber, the continuing pattern. And I liked that a lot. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Uh, this 
particular game is still in playtesting, and uh, I think it doesn't need much for playtesting, actually. I think uh, for playtesting purposes, personally, uh, I really like the way they handle the card board, like the board made out of playing cards. Uh, I like that you... Uh, something that we didn't touch on during the stream is I like that you... Uh, specifically pick out four face cards that are guaranteed going to be on the board because then you guaranteed have an endgame regardless of however many other cards you pull you have a limited volume of time and you could potentially have a shorter game because of the rest of the face cards remaining in the deck or you could have a potentially longer game and I really like that I don't know if that's a feature of the Carta engine specifically or if that's something that's been developed for this in particular either way i really like it um i like the prompts a lot i think the prompts don't need too much work either i think the prompts need uh several of the prompts need to focus more on the theme of the um of the focus more directly on the theme of the suit uh, i had to remind myself of the theme of the suit every now and again um that's really that's really the only shortcoming I ran into, um, other than me not having enough table space uh, for uh, the card-based board. But otherwise, I really like this game. I would heartily suggest it. Um, and I don't have any more playtesting notes, but I really dug it. Uh, I would... Yeah, I would be careful playing. The, uh, maybe toss a content warning out front in the rules. Uh, that's another thing. <laughs> you know, I think there is a, you know, if you have difficulty with memory, don't purchase this game. Uh, you know, if you have difficulty with theme, theme, and theme, don't buy this game on the purchase page, as I recall, which is how I remembered to warn you all about that. But uh, I think throwing that out front in the rules, if it's not already there, I might it might actually already be there and I might be just talking out of my butt, but I promise I read the rules this time, everybody. Uh, I really like, I really enjoyed this game. I think there's not a lot of touches that you need to do mechanically. Uh, I think that really the majority of your playtest addressments that are left is uh, maybe getting some art in the, uh, maybe getting some art in the rules. Uh, I really like the typesetting choices. They feel very appropriate. Uh, I really like the minimalist art choices already made in the rules. Um, the optional visual oracle rules for the second half of the, uh, of the deck is a really great way to handle people who aren't going to be able to just yarn off of a prompt, which sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. I definitely kept those in mind. Uh, there's an optional rule in the back of the book that says, yeah, you can pull uh, from the remaining cards to get some uh, get some visual uh, visual jumping off point for the memories, what you see, what this is. Uh, if you need a decision, or like the quick oracle, you know, including the rest of the deck as an option for that, as well as, you know, potentially having a second deck of cards around. That's great. I like that a lot. And I like the minimalist style chosen for the, uh, for the quick Oracle, I think, or the visual Oracle. I think you could lean into that. Um, there's even some, uh, the playing card examples make slight use of Allegrea. Yeah. It's based on the, uh, Carta system. But anyway, uh, there was also some, oh yeah, uh, du -du 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 influences. Yeah, I wanted to read these influences because they're very fun influences to look at. Magnus, come here. Sorry, hang on. Before we read these influences, I have to pick up a naughty and bad boy and show the world he beans because he was picking at the door and he knows that's illegal. Yeah, it's true. Illegal. You cannot pick at the door. He's like, no, you need to sleep. I do need to sleep soon. You're correct. But you cannot pick at the door, Mr. Doubloons. One, two, three, four. Okay, 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 okay. I've embarrassed you enough. Anyway, now that I've gotten distracted. 
Influences. Uh, this is in, this game is inspired by a 1983 Commodore 64 text adventure called Alvin the Android by Steve Peoples. I'm going to have to look that up now. Uh, <laughs> I may need to find a Commodore 60, 64 emulator and play that on stream because I love text adventures. Uh, Pixar's 2015 film Inside Out is also part of the mix. The curious reader may also seek out Am I Man or Machine from the 1950 Weird Fantasy 13 for the trope of brain or brain in a jar. Another thing that I might have to look up for paper cuts, depending on whether that uh, particular issue of Weird Fantasy is in the public domain or not. It's in the right volume of time to be able to be. Uh, Steve Moretzi's game, uh, A Mind Forever Voyaging, also plays the role of the subconscious muse. This game is dedicated in part to all those characters lost to time and memory due to incomplete saves, lost character sheets, those campaigns that fizzled or stopped unexpectedly, to books with lost bookmarks, rented movies returned while paused. All we get is that hyphen. Make the most of your life. That is a fantastic dedication. Uh, I have several characters that it could apply to. <laughs> but anyway, I really loved this. Uh... I gotta call it a night, though. Thank you all for watching so much. This was, uh, once again, this was Punch Card Memories. Uh, you can go find it on HIO. I will leave a link in the description of the video. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.